Hey, we are live. This is going to be a fun one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. You want to hear something criminal? I've never been to a show at the Cap. Tom. I know. I, Tom. I pitiful. Pitiful. Lots of invitations. Well, when's it going to re is it reopening soon? Will it be open in 2020 or 2021? Mm, I think the governor of New York will allow shows of some kind before the end of the year. Are these guys going to do it? I don't know. Right. Everybody's got to make their own choices for their own facilities. Um, what's good about the guys who have this place is that they've got a lot of social equity. So if they wanted to take the rest of the year off, I think they know that their fan base is still going to come back and the bands are still going to come back too. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I understand the Queens being sold here in Delaware again. Wow. Mm -hmm. What's the queen? It, it's a great venue for shows, for events, everything. Um, Oh, you, you know, everyone can hear us talking. Is that okay? That's what you yeah. want? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Live Nation was having shows there, but I think Live Nation pulled out. I think it's up for sale now. Great shows. Great, sadly, uh, great sound system. Well, sadly, there's a lot of venues like that that will not reopen, unfortunately. It just... That might be the biggest loss of all for us. Yeah. Restaurants, bars, all sorts of stuff that right. we like to spend our time and money supporting. But well, Tom, like you and the Ryman, I'm counting this as having played the cap. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I love it. We're going to give that to you. <laughs> I'm taking it. That's your story and you're sticking to it. That's I'm exactly going. right. We're, we're your witnesses. Saving <laughs> my career. All right, we're going to get started momentarily, you guys. Awesome. All right. It is showtime. Welcome to the 16th episode of The Smartest People in the Room. If you've been following this series, you understand what we are doing, celebrating incredibly smart, accomplished music industry executives, sharing their stories of their careers, their lives, and anecdotes about their past, present, and future. And if you've been paying close attention, you've also seen me broadcasting my portion of these events from some very interesting rooms. Well, today we've added a slight twist to the proceedings as one of our guests is broadcasting from one of the most iconic and amazing live music venues in the entire country, the spectacular Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York. More on that in a moment. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work that they do every day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. We love to help people make more connections in the music industry so they can further their careers. Who knew is all about helping to facilitate networking in this online format is the same. We feature executives like the two we have today. We put them in front of the audience and invite connectivity in, in hopes that everyone benefits. So please take advantage of this unique access to the speakers and the rest of the audience by engaging with everyone in the chat window. Also, please submit questions you'd like for Deborah and Kevin to address during their conversation. We will respond to as many questions as possible. Now, let me thank our sponsors for without their financial support, we couldn't do what we do. I want to thank First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, which by the way, anyone who knows me understands that's the search firm that I work for. I am a music industry headhunter. I also want to thank Fairlane Hotel, Core Power Yoga, Create Tennessee, or ten Create, um, sorry, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and also organics. Now let's get down to the program. Today I am pleased to welcome my good friend Kevin Cassini as our interviewer. In a moment, Kevin's going to share some information about where he is seat seated today, but for now let me share some of his background. Kevin is an attorney, consultant, moderator, professor, and occasional columnist. He's a member of the Recording Academy, Music Business Association, Copyright Alliance, 
Americana Music Association, and also boasts one full-length EP as his BMI credits. I want to hear more about that sometime, Kevin. No, you don't. He also serves on the nominating committee to the Boston Music Awards, the Board of Connecticut Folk, and is a member of the Judge Janet Bond Arthur Arthur whatever, American Inn of Court. You're going to have to tell us all about that one. Dedicated to the practice of intellectual property law. Sorry, I butchered that. That's all right. Kevin teaches entertainment law at Quinnipiac University School of Law. He and his wife, Colleen, live in historic Worcester section of New Haven with their twin boys, and who are, to wit, the youngest members ever of the Blues Foundation. That's something else we need to talk about. And joining Kevin as our special guest today is Deborah Manis Gardner. Deborah is the queen of sample clearances, according to Billboard, Forbes, Madame, Music Week, OK Player, Variety, and, and many others, and is the go-to expert for global music rights clearances. After starting her company, DMG Clearances Incorporated, in 1996, Deborah's cl sample clearance skills quickly became legendary, and she's cleared releases for artists including Drake, Tyler the Creator, DJ Khaled, Eminem, Pop Smoke, Logic, Justin Bieber, Kendrick Lamar, Lil Wayne, Frank Ocean, Jay-Z, John Legend, holy moly, Megan the Stallion, Brock Hampton, French Montana, Big Sean, J. Cole, Lady Gaga, Rihanna, Beyonce, and many more. Wow, what a lineup. She's also handled music clearances for films by Martin Scorsese, the Coen Brothers, and Richard Linklater, ad campaign clearances for Google, Ciroc, and Kmart, podcast music clearances for Broken Record and the actual Stretch and Bobito show, video game clearances for Rockstar Games franchises such as Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption, and Grand, and grand Rights clearance for Lin-Manuel Miranda's Broadway sensation Hamilton, in addition to clearing the music for its release on Disney+. Plus. Deborah has also served as the award-winning music supervisor of HBO's Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine docuseries called The Defiant Ones, and is currently music supervisor for the upcoming Neil Bogart and Cut, upcoming Neil Bogart and Casablanca Records biopic, Spinning Gold. She has spoken at South by Southwest, Medem, Music Biz, the A3C Festival, CMJ, the Nashville Film Festival, Sync Summit Nashville, as well as NYU, Temple University, and Widener College. Please welcome these two amazing people to today's version of the smartest people in the room. Have at it, guys. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you. Um, you mentioned briefly that I'm broadcasting today from the CAP. I'd love to talk for a few minutes about it. Um, I've seen you do some of these from iconic venues and I wanted to take this as my opportunity to pretend that I've played at legendary venues. This is one of the most historic we've got up here in the Northeast. Uh, you can see the amazing run demonstrated on the tiles in front of you, but in the 70s, the Grateful Dead played 13 shows over the course of a year here. They recently celebrated their 94th birthday, and I didn't think I could learn anything more about this place, but I looked it up and uh, read that not only did Janis Joplin debut her song Mercedes Benz on this stage that I'm staring at here, but she actually wrote it at a bar right next door. And so if we wrap up in time, I endeavor to try to find that bar no matter how many it may take me. What we're really here to talk about is the opportunity to discuss with Deborah about how she got into and navigates the world of sync clearances, um, mashups, um, samples for her rap artists. But I think it's probably easier to go through the list of things you haven't done and people you haven't worked with than it is to try to list all of the luminaries that have contacted you. Um, in preparation for this, uh, you and I were trying to have a couple calls, trade some emails, and you told me something I found fascinating. You said, um, Friday after five, I'm pretty much booked up, Kev, because once they start hitting the studio, my phone starts to explode. So if we could jump in, tell me, um, when you're on the other end of that call, 
what's that conversation like? Um, usually, you know, Friday is when everyone's saying we've got deadlines um, or we have ideas. You know, believe it or not, I do preventive sample clearances, which is we try to get people to tell us what they want to sample before they do it. If they've got a creative idea, if they're in the studio playing around and they immediately say, I want to use Anita Baker. And we say, please don't. She has never approved your stuff for being sampled. I respect her so much because it's just something she believes. And she doesn't bend for even people that she's friends with when Faith Evans wanted to sample. She says, you know, I can't because mm -hmm. if I do it for you, I have to do it for someone else. So I do preventive clearances. If we know something's gonna be too expensive, too difficult, too timely, I'm prepared to tell people, don't do it. And I don't get paid for that. It's just me giving people advice to try to stay on. So, so you offer cons counsel and advisement based on your history of experience with the individual people that they're looking to work with or, th or that they're looking to sample. Um, yes. It's interesting you, you say, you know, some of them you know from experience are going to be too expensive. Um, this type of licensing is one of the only areas, maybe the only area in the business where the exchange is really on the free market system, right? There's no consent decrees. There's no um, mandatory or, or compulsive licensing that has to happen here. If an artist doesn't want to grant use of their works in, say, some of the video games that you mentioned, um, they can't be compelled to do so. Um, so when you get into that, what, what in your mind, what are some of those free market factors that go into how things get priced since we're talking about maybe the only part of the music industry that operates the way free economy does? It, yeah, it's very different, you know, um, and even when you do have a deal and you have everything in writing, it can still go south in the world of sample clearances. Um, you know, when we first started doing clearances back in, I started actually in the early, back in 1990, um, and you would send the music out to the copyright holders with the material sampled, they'd be screaming, you're stealing from me, you know? So then you would try, okay, this is what we're thinking of doing. And they're like, well, how are we supposed to decide what we want to charge if we can't hear it? <laughs> so you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Um, so what we have to deal with now is um, being able to present to someone what the song should sound somewhat when it's, at its, um, when it's finished. And we have to reach out to the copyright holders. So you have to reach out to the publishers and the labels and the publishers have to reach out to the writers and the artists, uh, labels need to reach out to the artists. And then we start negotiating. There are some general numbers that are um, out there Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of the publishers ask for a non-recoupable fee, mm -hmm. um, and then they ask for a piece of the copyright. The labels usually ask for a recoupable fee, and then a percentage of PPD, and then a percentage of all third-party licensing. So for the I, benefit of people listening, break down PPD. What's, what's the acronym stand for? Well, that's price per dealership, but, you know, most people are like, well, what does that mean? What, is, mm -hmm. what does 8% of PPD mean? And sometimes you just have to say, well, it's about eight or nine cents. You know, these, these are really, we don't even have real numbers that we're working with. It's kind of like in the world of streaming. Right. Um, a, a, a client had released something back in 1996 and another client wanted to include it for synchronization purposes. So they actually asked us to go back and clear something from 1996. And the conversation was, well, it didn't really sell any units, but it was 1.8 million streams. Mm -hmm. What kind of value is that? It right. really is not a big value. And we pulled a number out of thin air and we said, well, how about we give you $5,000 and then we move forward. For and how did you arrive at 5,000? Just felt like a good number that your client was. Pulled it out of thin air. Right. <laughs> because what are you basing it on? You know, streaming doesn't even really have, you know, an, 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 an actual number that we can use for some of this stuff. All you a know, moving it's, target. You know, it, it's so everything, you know, and that's what's kind of neat about sampling. I've been doing it since 1990. And the evolution of what the deals are has changed dramatically. You know, at yeah. one point we were told this, this was a phase, this music isn't going to be around and people did actual buyout deals. You know, I got James Brown kid for a $500 buyout for me, by me. So we did buyout deals back then. Then it started evolving where the publishers, some wanted copyright ownership. They wanted to own a piece of the new copyright. 
Mm -hmm. Some of them only wanted income participation. Warner Chapel used to say, we only want income participation. So if the song gets sued, we don't want to be involved in that. Not but as a also, right holder of the new work, sure. Right. So the publishers were kind of split among how they wanted to do those deals. Right. They would take a recoupable advance. But then they found when they were getting their statements, it was very difficult to determine how much recouped and how much didn't recoup. Right. So it just kept evolving. About... I guess it's been maybe seven or eight years now that everyone kind of flipped over and said, the publisher said, we want just a flat fee to start off with, plus a piece of the publishing. And that fee evolved. It used to be $5,000 prorated amongst all the publishers if you had three to five publishers. Mm -hmm. Now it's become that every publisher gets the same amount, whether you have 50% or 2%, every publisher is getting the same amount. It's getting, it's getting very costly now. Yeah, so, sure. We're trying to work on this, trying to figure out what we can do about that. Um, I don't think it's ever going to go back in time. I think the publishers are always going to ask for that non-recoupable fee. It's a matter of how can we make it so if there's like six publishers that it doesn't become astronomical. So let's, uh, I, I see attorney Jaffe in the chat here is checking in and he asks a pretty good question in regards to Anita Baker or other artists like her. He says, when you're talking about getting those clearances, do you mean her rights in the composition or the sound recording clearance? Anita Baker's both sides. Anita Baker does not like her copyrights sampled. So Aretha Franklin doesn't either, but you can clear an Aretha Franklin master, Okay. but chances of getting the composition, because it's springtime, which is now handled by council, um, is very rare and slight. You know, it, got, it, Sometimes there's assignments to the label. And so he asks, uh, do you bypass the artist then if there's an assignment of the label? Or are you still looking for the approval, whether or not you need the authorization from the original artist? As the clearance agent, we never bypass anyone. We always respectfully go to the record label and to the publisher. For example, Drake is my client. If someone samples Drake, I would never go to Mr. Morgan. I would never go to Drake directly. I would never go to his camp. I'd go to Sony ATV because you never want to interfere with that relationship that the publishers have with their writers and the labels have with their artists. You have to respect that because if you start doing that, then it's going to be difficult for other clearances to happen. I think that's a great point and I've seen you and heard you make it a number of times and I don't think it can be overstated. There's a process and there are trusts put into place in relationships and assignments and people handle things as portions of the business. Let them handle it. Even if you have that personal relationship, let that relationship stay personal. Don't break it down by trying to bypass the system that's put into place okay. um, for you know any reason or another. But I've heard you say specifically, it, they may not want to offer it, but it, it becomes difficult for them to say no. And if you're playing on that, then you're going to end up losing the trust long term. That's not good for business. Exactly. It's not good for anybody. You know, there's, we're clearing music. We're not looking, I used to say we're not looking for a cure for cancer, but now I'm going to say we're not looking for a cure for COVID. <laughs> we need to uh, calm down. Everything, you know, even if we've got rushes, it's not going to be the end of the world. If something gets denied, it's not the end of the world. If something gets denied and it's released, we don't have to go into cease and desist, but we need to all work together to try to make sure that everyone is compensated for their copyrights. Everyone's happy. The bottom line is we're making music. We want to make sure that music earns revenue and everyone gets to enjoy it. It's it just seems, out of respect. It seems to me like someone should hire you now so they don't have to hire an attorney, me, later, right? You don't want to have to defend yourself um, later. So just get things cleared up out of the way. Um, in your introduction, Tom goes through that you're doing video games. You've done movies uh, with directors and producers that are luminary and the top of the field in music sampling. Would you talk a little bit about how it differs, uh, your process in clearing music for samples or mashups versus syncs for video games or for movies? Um, you know, when it comes to doing sample clearances, just like doing sync clearances, you're starting out with the basic research in the copyright holders. You're looking who the writers are, who the publishers are, what the splits are. And then on the master side, you're looking to see who the label is, who owns these rights. Um, when it comes to synchronization, I feel as though sometimes there's better communication because you're sending out this letter of request. It's pretty standard, you know, this is the budget, this is the synopsis, these are the rights we need. So you're looking at medium, term, 
territory, and it's all broken down. And your fees are then based on the breaking down of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Wordle sample clearances, in essence, you're creating a whole new copyright. So it has to be worldwide. It has to be in perpetuity or life of the copyright. It has to be all audio configurations. And we really need music videos, which is a topic I don't know if we want to discuss today, but I find that although you're given the music video rights, there's a secondary consent that's required. It's not necessarily in the quote letter and the labels are sometimes stuck because they need to take care of that video clearance. So it's almost like a, a secondary clearance. So the but, quote letter is what you get in response to your request. They say, here's what it would cost and here's what the terms of what you would use it for. Yeah, there's so much paper that goes back and forth. I mean, I send out a request letter. They send back a quote letter. I send back a confirmation letter. They send back label copy. Then I send back new writers, new publishers, and new splits. Now in the world of publishing, we don't even bother doing agreements anymore because no one was signing them. So these <laughs> documents going back and forth are pretty important because it's going to list all that information for people to register the copyrights. And because they do a secondary license, the publishers, they do a, a mechanical license, they're going to see their money paid off of that. Conversely, on the master side, you must get that agreement signed because if the label doesn't have a signed agreement, then it doesn't get in their system to account either quarterly or semi-annually, depending on how the deal is. There's all these like layers of, of stuff. I have three employees that just work on wrapping up deals, chasing splits, chasing publishing, getting you know affiliate, getting all that information because in essence, we're helping them with this new new copyright and then it's Got to get into ASCAP, got to get into the system, you know. Sync is so much easier. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, here's a question that came in from Anthony Stewart. He, he asks, among other things, do you feel hip hop artists are starting to sample less due to this lengthy process that you're talking about when you're trying to clear samples? Absolutely not. <laughs> I know that from my numbers, just from, from what I'm billing out, but Sampling is a style of music, it's a technique. And we shouldn't say, well, because it's so costly or this, that, and the other. There are other outlets that people can be using the sample from. So if you don't have that 50,000, 70,000, or $100,000 budget to pay all these licensing fees, there are companies out there like a track lib and like a splice um, um, so that you can, you can sample and keep your, keep your budget down. That's the whole, you know, and it's not like it's my competition. I'm really interested in it being kind of a captured market and how the economy of it gets decided uh, between the parties because there's nobody else involved in that. So can you discuss maybe briefly what some of the factors go uh, that are considered that go into establishing a price? I know you said you pulled 5,000 out of the air for that one that you discussed, but uh, just in general, not specific to any deals, what are some of the factors that get considered where you say, hey, that's too much, or um, we're only willing to accept this as a bottom line? Um, so on the, let's talk about the publishing side first. Sure. And kind of like what I said earlier, the publishers have pretty much established themselves to each collect a 2,500 non recoupable fee. Um, when it comes to percentages, that's a back and forth where we discuss it. You know, if it's only a couple words used one time, we pray and beg to try to keep that value, you know, 3% or 5%. I, you know, I was working with Kat over at Universal Music Publishing on Marshall's album, and she was really respectful. She saw that the uses were really tiny. She was able to talk to her writers, her approval parties, mm -hmm. and make it happen. And she had to balance the fact that Marshall is her writer and the sampled copyright holder is her, is her writer. So she's got this, this balancing act of wearing two hats and really has to, to pay attention me as the clearance agent, I've got to say, take that aside, but based on what the use of the sample is, you know, or if someone comes back and maybe the writer is a difficult writer and they quote 85% and I'll come back to the copyright holder and say, can, what can we do to, for you to convince your writer to bring it down to maybe 50%, which is more um, accurate to what the use is. Maybe it's a use that's looped throughout, but there are all these other elements in it. So those other writers deserve to get a share of it. Um, you know, I fight hard when I, when something comes in at a hundred percent, because I don't want things to come in at a hundred percent, especially if new elements have been added. Are there, are there times where a hundred percent would be an acceptable deal for you? The, the, the proposed exposure is just so great that you can't 
you can't walk away from it. Even if they want all of it, you, you say, fine, do it because you're going to make out on all these other ways. As the clearance agent, I would, you know, I would probably advise the client, you know, that's, that, that isn't necessarily good. Um, but I will always do whatever the client tells me to do. Okay. So if the client wants that, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I try to remind young and up and coming writers and artists um, that, that publishing is important to hold on to. It's like a piece of art. If you have a painting and it has value to it, you're going to put it in your will and it's going to get, you know, give, you know, when you pass away, it goes to your state and gets passed on to your children or family members or what have you. Although a song isn't tangible, you can't hold it. You have to have that same mentality. And I think what's going on currently where people are selling their catalogs, I yeah. think that should be um, eye-opening to people that their copyrights have an extreme value to it. So Brian Zisk is a friend of ours, um, sometimes from Hawaii and sometimes from San Francisco, depending on the weather, I guess. And he asks a really good question. Um, people hire you, Deb, because A, you know your stuff, and B, you know your people. Uh, and depending on the deal, either one of those is more important than the other. But he asks, if you can't afford a top clearance expert like yourself or an attorney, how can it be done in a simple and clean way so people can be safe and know that the clearances are gotten without having to come out of pocket for an enormous sum, if that's the case? Right. So one of the policies at my company is we're also here to educate people. So we actually do give out free advice. We do give people, you know, warnings if we think something's going to be expensive. If we say to them, you know what, if you re-record it, you're going to get rid of two thirds of your costs and sample clearances. And then we also say, again, there is TrackLib and there's Splice. There are other places where TrackLib, I think it's, it's already pre-established like $50 or, you know, a much lower rate for pre-existing copyrights. So I don't want people to give up sampling if they don't have a lot of money. It's an art, it's a skill. But if you don't have the money to use something that might has a value between five and $10,000, see if there's something else you can use. There are also libraries of stuff that, that you can get at, at, at lower costs. Don't throw that out if you've got the skill and you really enjoy sampling. I love it. I think it's a, it's a great thing. And don't make the money be the reason that you don't do it. Interesting. Good point. Don't let that stand in the way of what you see as your creativity and your outlet. I've had clients do GoFundMe so they could raise the money sure. to pay for their sample fees. <laughs> so I took a part of the weekend to try to do what it is you do, or at least get started on the process to see how difficult it really is. And uh, I found it a lot more challenging than I expected it to be. Uh, without using titles, I was working with uh, trying to get the contact information I would need and ask the right questions for a song that had two writers, one producer, and assignments for publishing and a label. And I ran into a, a couple of roadblocks, but one of the biggest things I thought was the vernacular that's being used in this subset of the industry, so to speak. So if you're up for it, I want to get into a lightning round a little bit where I throw out some terms, a couple of which I've seen in the chat already. And you tell us for your purposes, what does it mean? Because I thought I knew what all these things meant. And when I looked up the definitions, turns out I was a little bit wrong. And if I had drafted a contract, I probably would have been misusing them. You up for that? Let's do it. All right. First thing, controlled composition. Okay. So as you know, and just general in, in, in the world of contracts, when, people, when artists were signed to labels, there would be a controlled composition clause, which reduced the value of what they got on publishing. So maybe they would get stat rate for 10 songs, but if they had 11 songs, the rate started reducing. But then when you go to clear it for a sample, I would never offend a sampled publisher and ask for a reduced rate based on a controlled composition clause. I felt as though that was offensive. Um, and I learned that right in the beginning when, when I first sent out letters, we would ask them, people like, why should we give a reduced rate? Because the artist or the writer has a reduced rate or controlled composition clause in their license. Mm. And I said, you know what? That's a really valid point. So my letters won't, won't request that ever. So the next one that I came across, interpolation. And interpolation was a word that was created back in the early 90s. We used to call it, you know, replay or re-record a resung, and now it's the, to interpolate is to resing or to replay a sample. It, you know, you see that terminology and you know there's only one side to clear, just the publishing. And then we also try to make sure it's included in the credits. 
Um, credits are really important because 20 years down the road, you could open up like an old Mob Deep album and if it says contains samples of or contains interpolations of, you know if you've got to clear one side or two. So interpolation would be instead of me asking you to get a copy of the James Brown song of which I can take a bit, I'm going to get a band or a player to replay that and we only have to pay half of that licensing fee essentially that's what you're saying it's almost like a third because um you know your master fees are going to be between five and ten thousand dollars where your publishing fee is only going to be like twenty five hundred dollars so if it's james brown which is warner chapel most of his stuff is warner chapel and the master's universal and you use a vocal stab um warner chapel might only charge twenty five hundred fee plus a piece of the publishing where the label then is going to charge on top of that five or seven thousand dollars plus a percentage of PPD. You take that away and you've just dropped that down to only having to pay out 2,500 instead of 7,500 total. Miriam brings up a good point in the chat. Uh, Bittersweet Symphony would still be, well, she says it would have been semi-fine, but it would still be owned by the people who wrote it, so to speak, if it had been an interpolation. Uh, but didn't they get the rights back? Not. Oh yeah. yeah. So that's like a whole interesting one, yeah. Yeah, and the Stones have pretty good lawyers, so I bet it still would have been some, somewhat owned by them. Um, back to the lightning round. How about one stop? When an artist is deemed a one stop, what does that mean? Uh, the term one stop for me would mean that you only have one person and one place to go to to get the consent. So if that's true, does that allow them to ask for more because it's so easy to do? Or is it typically indies or something like that and so they end up getting less? It's typically indies and they usually charge a lot. <laughs> Oh, so it's indies and it's more. One stops have never been, um, in the world of stampling, one stops has not been economical in clearances. One stops in the world of sync is. Yes. And Again, so for different worlds. <laughs> so when an artist, especially an indie, uh, knows that she herself is a one stop, she should advertise that when she's looking for syncs. But if it's samples, then maybe not so much. Maybe not so much, yeah. Um, how about master use license? Master use license is the agreement we do with the record companies when we're securing the rights to the master. That's a very important agreement to get concluded because as I stated earlier, if you don't have a fully executed master use license, then they're not going to get accounted to by the label. So if you're Rhino and you've licensed out um, a portion of a recording, let's say it's I can't think, let's say it's Jimmy Smith. Um, and Universal is the label that released the new product. If they don't have a signed agreement from Rhino, it doesn't get into their system to do an accounting to pay them. So, so that's very important to conclude. In our Q&A, attorney Deborah Newman asks, when you have multiple writers, not one stop work, is it standard for each of them to accept the same license fee? And let me add another question onto that. Do you negotiate with each of them one at a time? Do you let them know where the other one comes in? Do you ask them to get themselves together first? I'm very transparent with everybody. So if I'm clearing a song and let's say there's four major publishers, let's say it's BMG, Sony ATV, Universal, and Warner Chapel. And I've sent a letter of request out to all four parties at the same time for publishing rights. And I've got a quote in from two of the publishers and they're probably about the same if they're not to try to get them on the same page. I will then let the other two publishers know what their co-publishers quoted. If you're dealing with an indie, if you're dealing with a small publishing company or self-published, so you've got three majors and an indie, then chances are, I'm gonna tell the indie, use the words most favored nation. I don't know if you got to that one in your lightning <laughs> round yet, but I'm gonna suggest for them to make sure they quote the same as the majors so that everyone's getting the same. It kind of goes back to what we said in the beginning about those fees. Back in the day, the fee might be $10,000 and it would get prorated based on what your percentage is. Today, it's a lot different. Today, everyone wants the same amount of money. So if Universal quotes $2,500, Warner Chapel gets $2,500, Sony ATV gets Warner Chapel uh, $2,500, and BMG gets $2,500. If the quote becomes 50%, that 50% gets split between the four. Do you ever get yourself, find yourself in a spot where th three of the four agree and one doesn't, and so you have to hold it back? 
I wear knee, knee pads and grovel all the time. <laughs> you usually get it done is what you're saying. I try. I really try to get everyone on the same page. There are people that have been difficult, um, not majors. There have been indies where I've just advised the client, pull it. Just just pull it. So, I've, but I've also played poker. Oh, that's interesting. Without divulging parties, tell me about that, playing poker. There was a publishing company because it was an A-list artist where they wanted like $20,000. And my argument is it shouldn't matter if it's Jay-Z or, or Khaled or Drake or Marshall. That publishing fee or advance should be, you know, what the going rate is. And so I said to them, he's done a version where your, your sample has been removed. Not just a read, but we, and he didn't. <laughs> but I, that's, you know, I've told people that we've, you know, sometimes I say that, that there are versions where the, sa that, that without the sample. And so would you like to be part of an A-list artist's album or not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know for me, I would love to have 3% of any Marshall song rather than nothing. Right. Right. hundred percent of zero is still going to be zero. We know that. Exactly. And although in any given, um, outlet you can hear me railing against the concept of exposure being the only value that an artist needs to get there is some as mr griffin who's in our chat will tell you there is still value to exposure um it waxes and wanes depending on where that exposure comes but something like that an a-list sample and you're you're talking about four star a-lists um it would be tough for anybody to say no to that i guess but there are some people that would say for instance with your video games not interested in having it associated with a violent video game or a video game about this, that, or the other thing. And I think I, I've heard enough from you to know that you would say, okay, we respect that and we're going to move elsewhere. Is that true? It's true. You, the first thing I'll say is if I get denied for something, whether it's a game, movie, or what have you, I'll say, is there anything we can do to change your mind? That's the first question. Is the obstacle money? Is the obstacle that you're offended and you just don't want to be part of it? Right. Um, and once I know what's on the other side, then if it's language, I say, okay, can we change the language? What can we do to make you feel comfortable? And sometimes it's like, no, there's nothing that can make me feel comfortable. And we say, okay, thank you. So um, are there any that are just completely impossible and just never going to work? You mean copyright holders or samples? Well, without naming names, are there some things that you know, like you said, for instance, when we got started, um, there's an artist that people try to sample because her work is really popular and you know from a fact that she just doesn't do it. You know, we have a list at my, at, that my staff has that we know to recommend whether it's someone who doesn't like to be sampled or maybe there are uncurred samples in the song and so they're not going to license it or, you know, maybe they're just very difficult just whether it's sample sync or across the board, you know? And so in that case, do you have enough of a database where you're comfortable saying, hey, you wanted to use Anita Baker, we can't get that, but there's a whole other segment of the market that might be open to it. Or do you just wait for them to come back to you with a new idea? I let them come back. You know, you have to remember people back in the day used to say, Deborah, can you really push my stuff and try to get people to sample it? Right. The answer is you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Right. So when these producers have something in mind, sometimes it's really difficult to get them to change their mind. But when they're young and up and coming, I'll say to them, go onto these sites, you know, legitimate sites. Um, there are some non-legitimate sites that sell beats and I tell people don't go to those sites because the, mm -hmm. the record labels are, are getting sued left and right over that stuff. Make sure you go to a legitimate site. And if you're a really good producer, see if there's something else you can use. Mm -hmm. So uh, another good question we've got in our Q&A from Eric Griffin says, in regards to best practices, are you getting a lot of requests for clearances for mashups? They seem to technically require a clearance, but could they rest on the transformative nature of the work? And I think it's a good question, partly because when Tom and I got started talking about this segment, he sent me a link and said, I want you to listen to this first. And I think it was an Avicii song that was doing a new version, so to speak, of a popular John Legend song. And I knew right away what we were going to get into. Um, and so I think from a legal standpoint, there's a lot of, uh, of interesting arguments to make. But from a business angle, do you get a lot of requests up front for mashups? Not up front. You know, a lot of these mashups are not done um, legally. They're not licensed legally. 
So, you know, back in the day when it was first starting out, like with the whole Jay-Z and Lincoln Park and stuff like that, people were doing it. Um, but not so much now, you know, it's become the wild west with a lot of that stuff. Um, and so we're not seeing as much of, of people clearing that as they should. The argument is, could it be, could it be deemed a medley even? How do you, you know, it, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always an argument to be made, which is pe why people like me get to be in business, I guess. But um, by the time it gets to us, we might say, you really just should have called Deborah and cleaned it up to begin with. Um, I think it's a very interesting question though, Eric, whether or not you can rest on a fair use argument for something like a mashup as opposed to uh, just a sample. I mean, fair use is never applied in the world of sampling. Yeah, for sure. I think it's been hashed out enough that people know where it does and doesn't fall. The mashup is going to be a little bit of a different work, right? You could make the transformative argument. If you're doing a good job, hopefully it's not just derivative. Um, but always safe to clear it first, where I come from. Right. Um, because you just never know. Um, but there are some people that like to push the envelope and maybe they purposely want to roll the dice because they want that question asked. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a fair question to ask. And I think we could talk a lot about whether or not a mashup falls into fair use. And so you really don't have to worry about it. Um, unfortunately, you're probably not going to find out until after you get to court on something like that. And that's not really where people want to be. I think parody, you know, parody is a good example where, you know, Luke Records pushed parody all the way up to the Supreme Court. I then, you know, so I don't really even like to touch parody, but Chris Rock did a whole album that was parody and we got denied across the board. This was like a long time ago. Um, and it, it was then pushed back to the attorneys for them to figure out what they wanted to do with it. Right. He right. shelved it, yeah. Right, I mean, there's a lot of parody artists that don't bother because they've gotten the opinion that they're looking for, which is you don't need to get approval Obviously, the most famous and successful one, Weird Al, the, the story still goes that he still gets his approval because it's not just a legal thing for him. He wants them to, the artists, to know that it, it's a, although it's a parody, it's not necessarily making fun of them specifically. And he, a lot of times, he gets them on board and they think it's funny and they like it. It's an homage. You know, if you go back and look at, at, at Hamilton, the stuff that we cleared for Hamilton, these were homages. Lynn was kind of tipping his hat and he wanted to clear this stuff because that music, he was music he was listening to. It was influencing him when he was writing stuff. So all of that was an homage. But if you were doing clearances for Hamilton too, let's say that that's a thing that's going to happen. You could get people to say yes instantaneously just by using that word or using his name. When you were doing it from the beginning, it didn't have the same weight as it does now. No. So how are you matter, yeah. the idea and how are you getting across to them what this is going to be other than saying, trust me, this is a cultural touchstone and this is going to change the way live theater is forever everywhere. Um, at, at which point most people would have rolled their eyes. How are you getting that across when you're talking about something like that? You know, it's hard on, on a lot of these projects and new technology and new stuff that I'm working on trying to convince people to take a chance. The biggest problem you have, I think with copyright holders is, well, what if I charge A and it really has a value of three times A and I, under, I undercharge? And I'm always saying you need to take a chance. I think podcasts are a perfect example where the publishers really hold back or they charge these high fees. They don't give you the broad rights that the podcast production companies need for delivery. But they're so scared that they're going to lose out or they say, well, is there ad revenue? Can I get a piece of that ad revenue? How do I make sure I'm making enough money? So you have that problem all the time. So if you are prospective about it and um, you look at it as an investment, then you might, if someone comes to you and asks for clearances for Hamilton, you might say, well, they, they're just getting started. They really don't have a lot of money, but let's take a percentage of back end revenues or something like that. In which case you're sitting very pretty right now. But um, what goes into deciding how you weight the front end versus the back end? Obviously there's gonna be some upfront payment but if people really believe in your product, uh, project, maybe they say, well, we don't want to get in the way of it getting off the ground. Let's just take a larger piece later. How do you deal with that? Or do you not deal with that? 
that doesn't work in the world of sample clearances. I have a lot of young people that say to me, I don't have any money. Can I give them money on the back end? Sometimes we even get these small film projects where people ask to do step deals based on box office. This is pre-COVID, of course. Mm -hmm. Those deals don't necessarily work. As a clearance agent, I'm able to do deals like that where people don't have money. And sometimes I'll say, okay, you don't have any money to pay me. Why don't you give me a percentage of the back end? And so I, I, I will do that for myself because I believe in a client. But it doesn't work in the world of samples. People are not interested in being business partners with people that they don't know. That's been my experience. When you're asking them to take a percentage of your product, with your project, what you're doing is you're asking them to go into business with you. They're tying their stakes. Now, Warner Chapel can afford to do that if they want to, but they never got this big by doing something like that. So it's very interesting. Um, Caitlin McLean Daly asks, um, what is a consistent challenge you face day to day? And someone asked earlier, um, what's the biggest issue that you face when you're trying to get these things across the finish line? I think it's the timeline. Um, you know, you get this project. I just got a project in from, from a, an amazing artist. They started out with three samples. I'm like, okay, this is good. You know, got my request out. They're like, Deborah, you have 10 days to make it happen. I'm like, all right, I'll send out urgent emails. And then that was on a Friday. And then Monday, they're like, oh, and here's eight more songs to clear. Right. <laughs> like what? So it's, it's that timeline of, and, and, and eventually the attorney stepped in and said, this isn't realistic. This is not going to clear. You cannot proceed. We need to make sure everything is secure. So I think that's my biggest, is the timeline of making sure that we, we hit the deadline. Um, we do a lot of work with Republic Island and Def Jam and I'm constantly asking them, give me a release schedule so that we know, it's not just getting a quote in. That's, you know, everyone thinks, oh, you just need to get a quote. No, we, you need to not just get a quote, but then you need to confirm the deal, let that sampled copyright holder know that we're moving forward. Hey, it's gonna take another 30 to 60 days before you get paid, but here's, paperwork to show that we're moving forward. So getting a quote does not mean you're okay to move forward. So are Perfect. there artists or, or catalogs that you're asked about consistently that just continue to provide samples to R&B, hip hop, rap music um, over and over again? Is there one or two that's really the most popular above board? I mean, I know for a while it was the same breakbeat from James Brown that got sampled I don't know, thousands of times. Warner Chapel likes to say it's James Brown and Cool in the Gang. So, and I think there's been articles written um, uh, claiming that. Um, I think a lot of people really like Isaac Hayes. I think a lot of people, you know, this was back when people were using the same stuff. They were using Parliament, George Clinton, Isaac Hayes, Al Green, you know, that kind of stuff. I think now people like to look outside the box um, and you've got YouTube. YouTube is how they dig through the crates. So if anything, we're clearing these crazy things out of Japan, China, Russia, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's getting really challenging. Very So hard. let's take a band like, like Cool and the Gang. Um, if you did, let's, we'll use round numbers. 50,000 is an even round number. You use $50,000 is what they're going to charge for you to sample Jungle Boogie. Um, how far do you track that money? Do you know, do you end up having to write the different checks or, or, or direct people? Like, don't forget, you've got to pay this writer, this writer, this writer, and this writer. They've got these publishers. They've got these labels. I mean, you could get to a point where you're writing 15, 20 checks at some point. Actually, it would be two checks. And if it was 50,000, I'd tell them to pull it. So, <laughs> sure. so it's cool in the gang. So although you've got like eight or 10 writers, it's all through Warner Chapel. And on the master side, it's universal. And actually, I have an employee who's actually on, Nicole, who, and it's her job to then advise the client, okay, we're moving, you're moving forward. It's a 2,500 non-recoupable fee. We need to get an invoice. We need to get a tax form um, on both sides from Warner Chapel and Universal. If it's a universal release, it goes up into the Uniport system. So, um, Nicole facilitates this, gets it in the Uniport system, connects them up to make sure that they're in that system. She works with people to make sure that there isn't a hold from the IRS to, you know, all this kind of stuff. Sure. Um, and so DMG, we don't cut any checks. Our job is to make sure that the invoices and the tax forms and the people are connected with the labels. If it's a small indie, then again, it's the same thing though. If they're cutting checks, 
or doing ACH, we help facilitate um, the paperwork. So, so then you're saying, well, let's follow the money. This is, this is a great thing that we were talking about initially. It's kind of interesting. So if Warner Chapel gets that $2,500 fee, do we assume that the publisher keeps half and then half of it then gets distributed to the 10 writers of the song? Um, Kat from Universal is on. Maybe she can <laughs> let us know how that money gets divvied up. <laughs> and on the master side, it's the same thing. Let's say it's a $5,000 fee that's getting paid to Universal. You know, don't forget back in the day, these contracts didn't say how the money was split up because samples didn't exist. <clears throat> so the equation that the labels would use was a 50-50 like you did with Sync. The label kept 50% and the other 50% would get divided up between the artist and the producers. Speaking of back in the day, Attorney Jaffe's got a question. Do you clear pre-1972 sound recordings the same as you do uh, more recent vintage? Yes, we do. And, and no one has said otherwise at this time. <laughs> See, Mark, it's up to you to say otherwise if you want the practice to change. <laughs> That's great. So the last couple that I have involve how can people start the process if they don't already have you in their Rolodex? Um, and where in the, the artistic and creative process do you find yourself getting called in by these folks? We get called in all over the place. You know, again, like I said in the beginning, I like to do preventive sampling. So if someone's even thinking about sampling stuff, you know, I'll have Khaled call me and say, you know, hey, what's up? I got this idea. And I have to talk them through it like, no, that's not going to happen. It's a Beatles song. You can't do it. Or, hey, not a problem. Um, let, let's get the ball rolling. So why, I, why would he not be able to do a Beatles song? I think I know the answer, but maybe not everybody does. Yeah, the Beatles aren't available for sampling. Not available for sampling means pass, not interested. Don't even bother again. But yeah, it, 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 was a, it was actually a cover that Aretha Franklin did a cover of a Beatles song and he didn't realize it was Beatles when he, when he first you know, hit me up on that. So. Um, oh, he wanted to use the Aretha version yeah. of a Beatles song. Yeah, he did. She's got the sound recording. They've got the composition. Right. Yeah. He was just being creative and spitting ideas and stuff like that. So we try to, you know, reach out to, you know, our clients or they reach out to us when they're thinking of something. When a producer's thinking of something, we can let them know it, how fast we can get it cleared or if it's going to be a problem. So uh, most were, of the time, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'd say most of the time, um, they go in the studio, they sample the song, and then they come to us. Because the bottom line is the sampled copyright holder is going to have to hear it to make that determination. Um, I'd say 95% of the stuff clears. You know, I used to say 98% of stuff clears. I think um, in the last year that, that it's changed. And I'm going to say 95%. I've gotten some, a lot of denials in, in 2020, which I've been surprised about. Um, Are you at liberty to share what some of those projects were? No. <laughs> okay, no, no. I had to ask. Uh, in our chat, Michelle asks if you could explain why the composition in our hypothetical would have been worth 2500 but the actual sound recording use was worth double. <clears throat> the deal structures have just become completely different. So the publishers usually ask for this non-recoupable fee. Um, where the labels ask for a recoupable fee. It, it, it's very different. You know, the publishers are going to get to own a piece of the new copyright. Right. It's almost like the sampled writers have sat down with the new writers and created this new song. On the master side, they can't own a piece of that new master recording because then the artist can't deliver per their contract anyone else owning a piece of that master. So they can only receive revenue derived from that use. Oh, wait. Okay. Um, it's funny, Kat sent me a, a text message letting me know what their policy is at Universal. <laughs> I was going to say, she's working right now for her clients, even though we're on this. She's working. She's amazing. Um, she's someone to look out for. She's up and coming. She's going to be in that seat soon. So on the, on the master side, because they're getting a fee and they can't, you know, in advance and they can't own it, it's going to get recouped against that percentage of PPD. We've seen in the music industry, what labels get and what publishers get is not the same. It's a very different world. We see that especially on the internet and with streaming and all that kind of stuff. So um, 
Publishers get to own a piece of new copyright. They get a non-recoupable fee. The labels do not get to own a piece of the copyright, so they get an advantage recoupable against royalties. It's like, so, and, and that's why I never allow most favored nations between the publisher and, and the label. I keep it very separate. Do you have a replacement for that policy or for that clause that you offer or that you suggest? Or do you just say, hey, don't do that? In, in what respect? You mean, you mean the MFN part? Yeah. You just can't do most favored nations because again, if the publisher is going to own a piece of the copyright, their fee is lower. The publishers don't get to own it. So their, their fee is the, the labels get the fee higher. It, we just try to keep it very separate and different. I never let most favored nations cross from the world of publishing and, and master. So um, I think Chris Cuban in our Q and A asked an interesting question. He asked, can you comment on the gray area of mixtapes? as a way for new artists to release products containing uncleared sample usage. I have feelings on that, but I'd love to hear yours first. What I try to warn people, if you sample something, you need to clear it. The argument is, well, this is, you know, my springboard and I'm not gonna earn any money. Um, but in essence, it's advertising, so it does have a value. But what really happens is when, let's say three to five years down the road after you've done this mixtape, you've been signed to Def Jam and you're putting out a legitimate album, you know that that copyright holder is gonna go online and Google what you've done and find those old samples and say, before I'm gonna give you a new quote, you need to back pay me for the old quote. And guess so, what, the price just went up. We try not to let that happen too much. There are some, the, the publishers are starting policies, like instead of charging that 2,500 non-recoupable fee, they might charge a 5,000 non-recoupable fee because it's been released prior to release. You know, it's almost their way of saying, well, we can't go back and get that streaming revenue, but we're going to get something. Um, and so we've gone back to re-clear mixtapes. We've just finished doing Lil Wayne. I think his just came out this week. Um, Nicki Minaj, uh, Big Crit. So people are going back and cleaning up their old mixtapes. But these manager to the money. stars In our chat, Manager to the Stars, Mark Tavern says, mixtapes cause so much trouble. I might say too much trouble. Um, may not be worth it. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's worth it. I think, I think it's, it, you should clear it. Let's go back to something that you and I keep mentioning, but we haven't defined and Jim, as he always does, keeps me between the rails. MFN, most favored nations. What's, what's that for you? In the world of sampling, most favored nations, we try to make sure that all the publishers are treated equally and fair. And so uh, one of my staff is dealing with a situation where a song was sampled. Um, it's three girls in a band. They own the publishing rights, they own the master rights, but each of the girls handle their own publishing. And one of the girls says, well, you're using my vocals, so I should get more. And I, I've explained, she can't get more. Um, she, she shouldn't get an extra amount of money because her vocals are used. If they all own the master together and they've split the publishing evenly between the three of them, then it all has to be the same. Right. And so that's most favorite nations. And so if they had a band agreement for themselves that split up the money that came in, then maybe they could get more than 33.33 or whatever it is. But for your purposes, you're not going to play that game. I won't. Yeah, I won't get involved in that. I respect that. You keep everything above board and try to make it easy so that you don't burn any bridges and you can always go back and have people work with people again. That's, that's the whole thing. I mean, I am always saying you get more from honey than vinegar. So treat people with respect, make sure you do fair deals. Um, and I always say if, if it's, if you have a copyright and you don't want people to sample it, then make it your rule that you don't sample it. Don't say, well, if you give me a hundred thousand dollars, I'll do it. It's either yes or no. Right. Yeah. You're opening up the door. Um, Matt Spence in our chaps in our chat asks, um, where would you get started if you were trying to do this type of thing? I tried over the weekend and I started, um, just with, um, information I could find available on BMI, ASCAP, um, uh, sound exchange, just publicly facing info to see if I could start getting contacts and tracking them down. Um, I ran out of time on mine. I set myself a 48 hour deadline and I ran out of time. What's the kind of timeline that you can usually expect to take to go through something like this? If someone has just one song to clear, they send, send it over to me, 
usually in under an hour, I can get all my request letters out, set up a, an Excel spreadsheet with what I've done um, so that they can see what the status is. And how about for video game? You said that was a little bit more challenging and taking more time. So sometimes to clear your mind, you go back to simple one song clearances. Right. So, you know, I do a lot of work with, um, with Rockstar. And so they like to use really obscure music. So it gets to be a challenge trying to find something that maybe was only released on a 45 back in 1983. And, you, you know, and it happens to be on YouTube. Those, you know, you're just constantly doing using Google and using search mechanisms to try to find these people. And, you know, thank God for social media. You know, back in the 90s, when we first started, you were using the telephone and calling around. So at least we have the internet where you are like an investigator trying to, is the person alive? Where did he live? How do I find him? Is he on Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. You're applying those skills also with sample clearances, but it's, I'd say maybe 2% of my samples are, are really difficult to find. And so, yeah, it's relaxing for me. Clearing samples kind of clears my mind. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you know, some people like to clean the floor. I like to clear a sample and it makes me feel better. I remember one of the first times I played one of those Rockstar video games, I heard a song. It was obscure, but I knew I knew it from somewhere. I couldn't figure out where. I find out maybe a decade later as I'm watching a movie, Scarface, it's a, mute, a song that's being played in the disco that they're dancing at in a scene in Scarface. And I thought, now how in the hell did they pull that out and put that in a video game 40 years later? Somebody must have had some aesthetic that they were looking for and they nailed it as far as I'm concerned. They have amazing music supervisors at that company. They're, um, you know, but even with the world of sampling, when my clients are sampling stuff and I'm like, I never heard this before. And you go online and you find the album and you're like, wow, this is really awesome. And it kind of like expands um, your taste, your knowledge. I love all this stuff. Yeah, the video games have come a long way since I was playing Pac-Man and Super Mario Brothers. Um, Anthony asks, does every single bit of music used need clearance? I think I know your answer. And what about some of them that use original works? Um, are they works for hire, perhaps? Or are they bespoke works, but maybe not works for hire? Is there any ownership that the writers retain in those? What do you mean? What does he mean by work for hire? I mean, if it's... If well, it's I use that term, but I, if somebody was hired by Rockstar to um, either produce or score the the oh, video okay. game itself. Okay, for video games. Yeah, that's work for hire. And okay. anything that's original is work for hire. Yeah. And if it's, it's not original, of course, it needs clearance. I think... Exactly. The, the overarching theme is there's going to be no hypothetical that you could pose to us where one of us is going to say, yeah, that use, no, you don't need any clearance for that. Just go ahead, go forth and prosper without getting permission on that one. Yeah, I don't think I've ever said that. I mean, and then you've got people who create original score and then put a sample in it. Right, for <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm going to go through the chat here and keep seeing – what do we've got? Speaking of independent artists who hires a producer to the, make the music, Carla Franco says, what do you think the max percentage would be based on the experience? I guess Carla means the max percentage that the producer would take versus the artists. You know, that's, that's, that's what you guys, the attorneys are going to negotiate because right. I always tell people the sample should come off the top. I mean, I remember talking to um, LL Cool J a couple of years ago where I reminded him when we did 14 shots to the dome, I actually remember the deal where Marley Marl was the producer and it was a 70 30 split where Marley had to take the hit of the sample out of his 30%. And I was like, I can't believe you remember that. I'm like, yeah, I don't know my son's phone number, but I remember crazy stuff like that. Um, what's great about working with people like Jay Cole or um, Jay Z and Khaled Marshall, they all have the sample come off the top. The idea is if the producer is the one who adds the sample, there's a reason the artist hired that producer. Chances are they know they're gonna sample and everyone's gonna eat from the great song. So everyone should have a reduction from the sample. That's my opinion, but some attorneys might feel differently and might feel as though the producer has to take the full hit. Right. I don't think that's fair, but that's not my job to negotiate. My job is to try to make sure that everyone gets to eat. Great. Well, listen, we're one minute over. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank the folks at the Capitol Theater, too, and let everybody know you can go to thecapitaltheater.com 
and check them out. Right now they're doing a really cool promo where they're selling tiles that are going to go on to a new refurbished portion of the theater, try to raise some money. Independent venues are getting hurt right now. So check that out, thecapitaltheater.com. Um, but for you, Deb, let's say somebody's jumped into our uh, Zoom today and they say, you know what, I'm convinced I need to get started with Deborah and get my stuff cleared. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you and your team to get started on something like that? You know, we list everything on our website, including our email addresses. So you just go to www.dmgclearances.com. Um, it's my policy to respond to every email. And when people ask for our fees and our breakdown, we always respond within 24 hours, letting them know what our fees are, what our thoughts are, and who's going to get assigned the project because I've got an amazing team and staff. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put your web address and the web address for my consulting company in the chat. If people want to look us up again, all our stuff is available too. Um, and if you've got questions about clearances and you call me, I'm just going to route them to you anyway. So they might as well call you. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Final words. Just keep making music and be nice. <laughs> <laughs> music can be nice. I think that's great. We'll leave it at that. Thanks, everybody. Tom, thank you. Thanks, from Tom. I appreciate from everything. Delaware. Hey, uh, thank you to you guys. Um, on behalf of the audience, I'll just say you slayed it. And I knew you would. You know, Deborah, it's such a pleasure to hear from you. And I want to thank both of you for just giving so freely of your knowledge. This, this kind of stuff costs real money in the real world. I know that. But you've just shared some CLE quality knowledge with the audience. So thank you for being generous with your time and your, your brain power. Um, folks, we're gonna wrap up now. Our next program is 48 hours from now. We're bringing back two of my favorites. This time it's going to be Dick Huey and Vicki Nauman. This time uh, Dick is the featured guest and Vicki is going to interview him. These are two digital pioneers and as much as you learn today about clearances, you'll learn that much more about digital music and the ways and means of making money in that realm. So thank you again to everybody. Be safe, wear a mask, and vote on November 3rd. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>